Throughout my adult life, my focus has been on making the world a more beautiful place. Initially, I pursued this goal as a hairstylist, working on the external appearance of individuals to make them feel more beautiful. However, I wanted more, so I began to shift my focus to helping people make better choices and achieve greater beauty from within. As a transformational life coach, I specialize in helping you identify and change the limiting beliefs that may be holding you back. Join me each week as we discuss, interview, teach, and explore the fundamental principles of healthy relationships. Welcome to Conscious Conversations with Louisa. Amelia, I am so honored to have you here. Through Secret Knock, I have learned how much I love co-creating with everyone. So what I have started to do is asking David Reed to read the bio and introduce you, and then I get to take it over from there. I'll get, have an opportunity to ask you questions and open then open it up to everyone else to have an opportunity to get to know you. Sure. So, David Reed, would well, you- Well, thank you. Thank you, Amelia. And Amelia Antonetti is one of the most sought after human behavior and strategic advisor experts in the okay. world. She has appeared as a regular business and behavior expert on The Oprah Winfrey Show, Steve Harvey, Dr. Phil, and she's built or advised over $2 billion in sales for companies and high-profile clients such as Steve Harvey, Mike Tyson, Cold Stone Creamery, George Foreman Grill, which I'm immensely familiar with, Data Doctor. She's even been featured in People Magazine, Time, Forbes, Smart Money, and Entrepreneur, and has been named in the 55 People You Must Meet by Jack Canfield. And today, her, she is the CEO and creator of Design Genius, a powerful training and development platform that changes the paradigm on how companies, op opportunities, and our greatest asset, the people, come together as we answer the call of the gig economy. So without further ado, back to you, Louisa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amelia, I heard you for the first time only a few, uh, a few months ago. And you absolutely blew my mind because there are remarkable women in the world, but they're very, the experiencing you truly felt like an experience. It wasn't like, oh, it's so cool that she did that. I literally was like, how did she do that? Who is she? How did she get created? I love that you are here. I'm honored to be able to highlight you. Please let us know who you are and how this all started for you. You know, I they always say that things start out of a necessity, right? So I was emancipated at 15 um, and took legal custody of my younger brothers. Um, and the first thing I needed to figure out was how to keep a roof over his head, right? And so when I started, there really, there was no such word as entrepreneur. Like I never heard that, you know, even small business owner. All I knew is I needed to figure out a way to basically get, you know, week by week and just survive just to make sure that I could provide you know, a safe home for my brothers. And so as a 15 year old, again, I don't know if any of you got kids and you've looked at your 15 year old, I look at mine and I go, I do not know how I did it. Um, and so that's what it, I really wasn't thinking about anything other than what can I do to make money to make sure that I could, you know, just have us survive. And, you know, slowly what I started to realize was that I had a unique skill set. you know, that I looked at situations very, very differently. So my very first company was in construction. Um, and I started to realize that my problem solving was completely outside of anything that was like, uh, taught. Right. And so I went from construction, I then had 18 restaurants and sold them. And then I stumbled into my claim to fame, which was, um, building a mass consumer good, which ended up getting sold to Clorox. Um, and so growing that company, right. So that company went from zero to about 180, um, I knew that if I was going to be the CEO of this company, like, why would somebody come work for me? I had to create an environment that was about them, right? What they, what they desired, what was important to them, not important to me or not important to the company. And so from a, from that kind of young CEO mindset, I started doing literally putting honeypots around the company, asking my employees what they were doing when they were not working for me. And so they were like, really? Like, like just what we're doing? I'm like, yeah. So they're like, well, we're doing laundry and we're doing yard work and we're taking the car to get oil changes and going to, you know, Sam's Club and Costco. And they were doing chores around the house. And so every week I took something out of the honeydew pot and I solved the problem 
as a company. And so the first thing I did was I brought something in. So all the tire rotations and oil changing was done in our parking lot, right? So I had 200 and some odd cars that they did it while they're at work instead of, you know, spending time doing it on the weekends. And then it was, you know, we brought all the laundry to work and then it was all the dry cleaning and then it was grocery shopping. And so one by one, I took the things that causes stress away from my team so that when they were home, all they needed to do was be, you know, great wives, great husbands and great parents so that the company handled those stressors. Um, and what I, I started to be able to lean into was what I do naturally you know, as a CEO, isn't what comes naturally to everybody else. So I can negotiate on a larger scale, changing oil, right? For 10 bucks a car versus 40 bucks a car and them spending two hours on their weekend. And so I use the same comp, the same uh, skill sets of what I did to grow the company to solve everyday problems. And it really created a community within the organization so that we group thought and we group solved. And we solved in a way that not only helped them save time, but also save money, but just the headache of coordinating all of these like honeydews. And um, I then very publicly, uh, where it was not popular at the time, you know, went on, you know, uh, the Oprah, Oprah show and basically said, my, my role as a CEO is to take care of right? My team. And then my team takes care of the customers. I don't think about the customers. I think about my team. And that's how people learn how to treat other people. And so I really leaned into really studying human behavior in every way possible to understand what makes humans tick, because there's so much misconceptions that are out there. And so when I was doing this in the 80s and early 90s, you know, everybody was about personality test, personality test, personality test. Uh, without understanding that at the core as humans, we are designed for curiosity and growth. So any assessment is making the assumption you're going to stay static for the rest of your life. And it also does not give way to free will. So you may be conditioned to be an INTJ, but if you free will, right, to choose to be opposite of that, right? You have choices on how we behave. We have choices on who we become. And so as we've studied more around, you know, how the brain works and like that, we realize that you choose who you want to be. That's a choice. And so understanding that, you know, some people consciously take action and design who they are and other people use it as the story that they tell. And I wanted to lean in and I wanted to groom people who wanted to develop into their highest and best self. And I created tons and tons and tons and tons of games in order to be able to counterweight a behavior that you wanted to change. And so all the games and designing genius, all the stuff that we're de doing, teaching everyday life skills um, is all about that. It's an end-to-end -end process that allows people to operate together in a system for the power of the mastering of the minds, right? We're stronger together than we will ever be apart. And we just systemize it all to make it really, really easy. That is so powerful and so magnificent. I, what does your day look like? How do you pour into yourself to be able to show up so powerfully for everyone else? Like, who, how do you become you in order to like- yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, they're all the same tools, right? So the first 22 minutes of your day and the last 22 minutes of your day is the most critical because your brain remembers the beginning and the end, right? So you could have a disaster in the middle, but if you actually intentionally set, right, based on, you know, how, you know, your mind, your body and your spirit, right? On those two bookends, your, your body, your mind believes it had a good day, right? And so- what I try to teach people is to protect, right, your thoughts during those two bookends. Unfortunately, most people wake up and the first thing they do is they give their power away by checking their phone. So now your phone is dictating how you feel about your day. And I would never give power, right, of how I'm going to feel about my day to anyone or anything. So the first 22 minutes are very much controlled, be able to ground my mind right? Ground my body and ground my intention for the day. And I do that in the first 22 minutes. And I do the same thing. I have a very, very uh, practice at night that allows me to lean into my evening routine. 
And so just focusing on who you want to become first on your bookends and then a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more, you know, changes happen over time. The reason why people quit is because they try to do it all at once or do too much. Like, oh, I'm going to work out. I'm going to work out for two hours a day. No, you're not. Right. And so you learn how to start stacking behaviors in an area that you already have a habit formed. Right. So you take a habit that already exists and you put a new practice right there. I literally tell people if you've never worked out before, but you want to work out, take the first week. And all I want you to do is go to the gym, don't work out, go to the gym, go inside and then go home. And the reason why I say that is because when you go into the gym and don't work out, or if you spend five minutes working out and you leave, you create an energy that says you wanted to do more. You're like, this is ridiculous. I could do more, right? Which is a positive uptake. Instead of going and trying to work out for the hour and leaving going, oh my God, I'm so behind on everything, right? Energy produces more energy. So week one, it's just to establish the routine to get there. Then you do five minutes. Then you do 10 minutes. You always want to leave a new behavior with you wanting to do more. So you got to stop before you tip over on the other side, right? That's what the whole time blocking about, right? Time blocking is to set a very specific time to do a specific task without interruption so that when you stop it, you actually wanted more right? And if you haven't finished it, you block it again so that you come back into it with fresh eyes. And so all of these behavior hacks allows people to be very, very highly productive with less amount of time, not more time. That's a myth. Right. I mean, look at how many things you are running with the same 24 hours the rest of the world has. And there's something about how you do it that works. And I love this. Is it what do you do in those 22 minutes I'm in the beginning and in the end? Yeah. So for the first, so for me, right. So I start my morning because you're dehydrated when you wake up. So 24 ounces of water are sitting on my night table. I take that in my supplements before I do anything else. Um, and then I flip over and I start meditation, right? So I ground my mind before I put the feet on my feet on the floor. Um, and then I work through gratitude, right? Because what you do not value, you will lose. And so I make sure every day that I not only set my intention, but I actually hold a space of gratitude for the things I woke up. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm on the right side of the dirt. I'll take that, right? Kind of go from there. And so really kind of walk through the fact that I'm aligning my mind that I'm grateful, right? And to be appreciative for the things that I do have so I can hold on to them. And then the intention of the day allows me to set that expectation of the one thing that I know I actually really want to accomplish today. Uh, and then I actually go and work out, right? So anything that comes out of my thinking, like my meditation and my gratitude, whatever that needs to be released, I can then use the workout, right? To release the energy. So anything that you want to let go, mentally does not release your mind unless you do it throughout the body, right? Because we we store pain in our body, not in our mind. It's connected. So that's how we get. So I use the workout to release anything that's just not working for me. And then I kind of go about my little, you know, I love coffee. So I have my coffee in the morning and that kind of stuff. And then I lean into my first time block. And so I use my energy my natural cadence of energy. So I'm a morning person. So I'm strongest in the morning. And so I knock out my value drivers the things that drive value in my business in the morning that I move to clients. And then I go into repetitive tasks. Um, so I'm using time in alliance with my natural cadence. So that means whatever I'm doing is 10 times fast, um, stronger because I'm doing it in the hour that actually matches the outcome versus just trying to, most people use their calendar by default instead of saying, when am I strongest? When am I weakness? What aligns with what? So I'm using every single thing to my fullest advantage. So I'm constantly building capacity. So my day does not drain me. My day is actually stacking to build capacity. I love that so much because I actually only got that in my 40s. It took me a while to like figure out my rhythm and figure out when I'm the most powerful. And what I also noticed was taking a mini nap, like a 70 to 20 minute nap reset me. And then I can powerfully work through the rest of the day where I would go, oh my God, now I'm tired. But that mini reset, and it's it's usually a meditation that leads to a quick little yep. nap that, yep. that keeps going. 
Um, you've mentioned something I think is tremendous. The one thing, do you stick to the one thing and com complete something or do you really have a couple big things that you're committed to that you're doing? Well, I only stay on like my time is only aligned with things that are driving value in the business, right? So I try to touch something one time and then systematize it, mm. right? So that I'm not doing anything repetitive. So I'm always, whatever it is that I'm doing, I'm trying to then say, okay, who's the next person in the, in the company who's going to start doing this thing? So like even this podcast, right? We've got people that are now getting certified in our behavior, right? Becoming uh, accredited certification so that somebody else can do this. So anytime I am doing anything, I automatically go, who's the next person who's going to start doing this? Because it's not going to be me as I move from CEO to chairman, right? On that journey to chairman, right? Everything that I do has to get transferred. That knowledge has to get transferred. So it's either getting transferred into a system or it's getting invested into an individual who's going to take on this role. And so that is always my mindset that I will only be doing it this one time. So I am very intentional when I do it so that it can be repeated by somebody else. So I'm going to share something that does not work with me that I end up doing. And I would love to have hear feedback on that. So I'll systematize it. Like I got my email list going and then I'm like, Oh, should I use a different platform? What do you do when all of a sudden you have it going, it's moving, and then you want to shift it. And then the next person who could actually work with it only uses a different platform. Would you, what would you do when you think you have it moving forward, but you keep finding yourself re redoing things? Right. And so that's busy work. Right. Right. Because so you want to be able to take something and get it into motion. And when you want to go back to redo, you have to say, well, what's the desired outcome? Is this my highest and best use at this moment? Right. So we practice something called the 70 percent rule. Right. You want to go 70 percent. You're looking for 70 percent, 70 percent success and not get into the weeds on the remaining 30. It allows for collaboration, but it also allows for measurement. Because if you've got a system working, you've got enough data to be able to analyze, is it even worth your time, right? Why redo and redo if you can't validate that's actually driving value or monetizing in some way? So a system to one system to another system isn't going to help that system monetize, right? You're either in the right lane or not. If something is actually then producing, right, causing value, whether it's monetization or value to the business, then you take a look at somebody whose area of genius is systems and they look at it to say, how are they going to perfect the system, right? Your area of genius is not systems. Your area of genius is to get enough of things going to then measure to go, okay, what are we going to start, stop and swap? What are we going to keep doing? What are we going to stop doing? Because it's not working towards the end. And so getting into the weeds isn't what creates success, right? It's getting enough data to measure to say, is this moving to my overarching goal? Right. Too many times we get distracted with things that are really ego driven, right? That, you know, it's entertaining, but it doesn't monetize. So why would you be doing it? Right. You're doing something and yet it's causing more aggravation than it's worth. Right. So being able to start, test, and delete as fast as possible. And then once something gets sticky, hand it to somebody who that's their area of expertise, that that's what they do better than anybody else, because they're going to be able to take it the 30% the of the way. Right. The, the tweaking is at the end. That's why I always say, don't go past 70%. Go 70%. This way you're not, you've got room for collaboration. You're not going to defend your position because you know it's not done, right? But it's enough to test to see if it's going to work. And that's with anything, with anything. Do not spend all of your energy right down on the rabbit hole on one thing before you've been able to figure out, do I even like it? Does it even work? Is it even pushing me towards the end game? So I don't put a lot of energy into things until I realize, oh, this I really kind of like, right? Because it's enough for me to come back and do it again. Right. I mean, even honestly, the mastermind, I love it so much. When I started, I'm like, this makes me so happy. And I had a few coaches say, pull the plug. It's just not monetizing. It's time to pull the plug. And honestly, I love it so much. I was like, I see a vision for it. And I held on to it. And, and now look at all of us here. It really took a life of its own and it's beautiful. Right. So how do you know when something like, I guess it was really just loving it. It really was how much I loved it and knowing and trusting my gut to keep going. Or there's an aspect of it that you love, 
right? When we love something, it's usually not in totality, right? It's being able to identify and understand how to decode your own behavior, right? To say, what specifically about this do I love? And the way you be able to identify it is by stacking it next to other things that you love and what's the common denominator, right? So the common denominator may be that you love things that just involve people, right? You love things that have to do with growth. You love like this sense of community. It may have nothing to do with the mastermind. It may be the elements within that you actually love. Absolutely. That's exactly what it is. That's what lights my soul on fire. And I get so, I'm like, is it time yet? Is it time yet to go to sleep for morning to come because it's the day. Right. And yeah, I do get to have that with a lot of things that I do because I naturally, I think I'm in, uh, I love having fun and I love having fun with people. And so I always ask this question, what had you say yes to me to be on today? Because everyone says to me, how do you meet the most amazing people? And how do you get all these remarkable people on today? So I literally have been asking everyone, what had you say yes? You know, I really feel um, a, a very, you know, s- sense of connection to try to help other people, right? I always try to take the standpoint that going, what would I wish I would have known sooner that would have made my life less painful, right? And especially in the space with women with women, we have so much that comes out of us that that showcases women not in their best light, you know? And I'm like, you know, I have a girl group that's a little bit more like sex in the city, not like the housewives, right? And so when I see, uh, you know, either whether it's social media or TV or movies that showcase women just not supporting each other, I really feel compelled to say, I don't have anybody like that in my life, right? I am the first one to reach out to, you know, help another woman, you know, so that she can not have to step in the, you know, the ebb and flow that I did. You know, people who want to be business owners, you know, male, female, it doesn't matter, right? If somebody would have leaned in with me sooner to try to give me real information so that I didn't have to like kind of go the long way. So I think that as you kind of get on the other side of life, it's really important that you go back and you share the knowledge so that that next generation can do something and the next generation can do something. I think it's a sense of responsibility that if you've learned something to share right? Don't keep it to yourself, share it with other people, right? And so I do that with, you know, anything that I've learned, right? I'm I'm very clear to say, I can share with you what I know based on the choices I made. I know that there was other options, but I have no knowledge of what would have happened if I would have gone left and said, right, right? So uh, one of my quippets that I always say is, you know, your your advice is worth a dime, but your experience is worth millions because I can't give you advice, right? I have no idea what it's like to be you. But what I can do is I can say, oh, that's similar to something I experience. And I only speak from my experience so that you can take that information and use it for your, you know, for your own good. Absolutely. So I actually want to touch on that. You know, we always think someone as powerful and I I referred to like a bulldozer earlier because you like really go in for it. Right. But like, what is it like when you're like, oh no, something just happened. I have to regroup and I get to look at this. How do you, I can almost, I could see you not letting anyone take space in your mind and, and creating uh, it to be uncomfortable, but think uncomfortable things happen. How do you address that? So I try to, you know, you know, I, I definitely, you know, I have my own emotions, you know, and I definitely have the work that I'm working on. I'm constantly working on some aspect of how can Amelia be better. Um, and so when I'm triggered, right. So anytime I'm triggered, right. So your emotions are just an indicator to say, look here. And so when I'm triggered, I really want to get clear with, well, what's really happening on my side? Like, what is it? You know, I'm triggered because am I feeling, you know, angry or do I feel like a a need to defend my position or am I hurt or, you know, what is it that's actually happening within me and where, where am I feeling it so that I can kind of understand that that's on my side. And the last thing I want to do is take something that's on my side and throw it on you, right? Because I'm the one who has the tools, 
right? I'm the only one who has control over me. You have no control over me. And so I don't want to push something over on your side. So once I can identify what's happening for me, then I can then communicate. I can go, hey, listen, I am so triggered right now. I can't even hear what you just said. And it is all me. I don't want you, this is all me and I need a minute, right? So I need a minute to either like circle back or come back or can we switch topics or whatever. I have to be 100% responsible for my end, how I think, how I feel, what I'm interpreting. That is all my work to do and to communicate on your side. Now, if the trigger has something where I can be useful to say, hey, listen, you've just hit a boundary with me. I just want to share that that doesn't work for me. And so here's the suggestion. If you'd like to continue this conversation, if you would lower your voice, I'm happy to stay in the conversation. But if you're going to continue to raise your voice, I am going to hang up and or leave, right? And so I can still hold my boundaries, right? Even through a trigger, because I'm very clear on what my minimum standards are, right? And I also know why. Right. I also know why that those exist. Right. So for yelling for me is I came out of a very yelling childhood. I'm happy I got out of that and I don't want any more yelling. I've had all the yelling that I can handle. And so if you are yelling, I will very politely remove myself from the situation. And so I protect my thoughts, but I also protect my boundaries and I'm clear where my boundaries are. And I don't apologize for them because you can be friends with somebody else. This is kind of the gig you get with Amelia yelling. Is it my thing? If it's your thing and that doesn't work for you, you can be friends with somebody else. But for me, it does too much damage. It does too much damage. And so no relationship is worth me having to survive it again. (laughs) I'm happy I did it the first time. I don't want to go back, right? And so I think that I'm always really clear on what is really happening and not allow myself to tell my root pain, right? So, you know, there's five areas of pain. Everybody has one of one of them. Some of us have multiple of them. And I realize that when I'm the most hurt, even though I would like to say it's you who's doing it, I would love to be able to say it's all you, you're doing it, you're causing me that pain. The reality is it's a pain that existed long before you got here. And I am participating in feeling that pain. And that's part of my healing. And so I have to be able to take that responsibility and say, listen, our relationship isn't going to work because I have not figured out how to not feel so triggered because I feel abandoned. It's not you. I haven't figured out the tool. So this isn't going to be healthy because if I allow myself to respond the way I would like to respond, you're not going to feel good, right? So removing myself from situations is really about, I mean, I always say, you know, think of me like a, a a big ferocious Rottweiler. I will bite your face off unless I regulate myself. I have to, right, practice regulating my emotions because if not, I'm a dangerous weapon. <laughs> and so I realize that some relationships just don't work for me. It right. doesn't bring out the Amelia I want to be. Right. And I think that that's where it's really hardest is when, we start not being the person that we want to be, you know, and again, I woke up one day and, you know, looked in the mirror and I was like, oh my God, well, who are you? It's not who I want to be. And so I choose who I want to be and I choose how I want to show up and I choose what I want to be able to give in the world. And if your energy isn't helping me be the best me, then it's best for both of us just to agree to disagree that right now it doesn't work. It doesn't mean it's not going to work as I learn new tools and I grow, but for right now, you're not bringing out the best in me and I'm not bringing out the best in you. So true. So true. As a matter of fact, I recently just said, I'm like, there are things I thought I didn't like. And I realized it was, I didn't like it with those, that person. And then I'm like, wow, I actually really like those things. I just didn't know I did. It's like, there are people who really do trigger and, and it's, you're, it doesn't define who you are. It just means it's energetically, it's not in flow at that moment. Yeah. And I think the hardest thing is to really identify what it is you need, right? And so we have all these tools in designing genius. One of them is DNR, right? One is, right, to be able to, to be able to say, okay, what is the desired outcome? Like, what do I want out of this? Like a lot of times we're just in it and we're like, why am I here? What am I even doing, right? What's my desired outcome? And then what do I need? Like, what do I actually need? Well, you have to be able to not only know what the outcome is, but you need to know what your needs are. And we're not taught 
how to speak up for our needs. So most of the time, people don't even know what they need. So if I sense it in somebody, right, I'm like, something doesn't feel right, right? Or somebody's not showing up at their best. And I, I can stop and say, hey, what do you need from me right now? You know, do you need some space? Do you need me to be quiet? You want, you know, what do you need? Because we don't practice that as a society to lean in. We automatically go to the fact that somebody must be doing something to us. And I'm like, are you kidding? They're ba- they're paddling just to stay on their own. They're, it's not about doing anything to you. They're in survival mode right now. And so really being able to understand what is my needs so that I can speak them. Because if I can specifically say my desired outcome is whatever, to leave for dinner. And what I need is, you know, you not to ask me to do something five minutes before I'm heading out the door, right? Now we're actually collaborating into getting a, you know, solving the problem together. <clears throat> and that's where we go wrong. We make massive assumptions that other people have the same outcome. It's usually not even the same, especially in like a work environment. You know, when I do this in work, we have our behavioral tools. And the first thing that people realize is I think the outcome is a report to do today. And you think the outcome is that it's an Excel spreadsheet that's due this week. So we're already on two different sides, right? And then I think the need is you need me to do it all. And your thing was like, no, I just needed you to kind of structure it. Right. And so we're always trying to like guess because we just don't ask. Right. And so following some of these behavioral tools allows everybody to use the same vernacular and right, use the same tool. Right. So that's what we created all these different games that allows you to alleviate the conflict and raise your capacity because there's no more guessing. And so every time you activate one of our tools, what it's doing is it's removing the emotion completely removing the emotion and just saying, oh, I need this or you need that. And, you know, here's your outcome, my outcome, you know, here's the, the, you know, the reason why it matters to you. And here's the reason why it matters to me. And so when people use the tools, everything starts hitting flow. So, so powerful. I actually want to follow through with that. I know you have your session coming up. I really want to be able to highlight it in here. And um, before anyone even has an opportunity to ask you questions, can we hear what that is, when is it, how do people sign up? And we could probably put it in the chat for, um, and then we can continue because I really, the reason I wanted you on tonight, like instead of later is because I know this is coming up and how huge this is. So what, so, you know, I am a data and tech gal, right? That's kind of my background. That's kind of my shtick, right? And so I wanted to create the tools for service-based businesses, right? So for coaches and consultants, right? For people who have businesses that are about service because the behavioral tools allows you to quickly identify what's really going on, right? So just pretend if you were a therapist, right? Well, a therapist spends the first three sessions trying to figure out the root of what's happening. Well, with this tool, it tells you right away. So right from the first session, you know the root that you're dealing with. If you are, you know, in a service-based business, our tools allows you to customize the service, right, based on the value drivers of the individuals. And so what we wanted to do was to take people in different industries and certify them on our tools and then show us how their tool, show you how your our tools amplify your business. It either opens up a brand new line item that you don't have or it allows you to charge a higher price because of the customization on, right, what's happening for the individual. And so that's what we're doing right now is we're reaching and we're putting in certifications on the behavior tools and then helping people move them into their different industries. So from education to transportation to, I mean, mass consumer goods and retail, insurance, financing, all of it has to do with pi- people. And so using our tools to understand right? How to better deal with people is what we're all about. We're like the intel on the inside. I love it. And how long is the course and how is there a link we could share to have everything? Or or actually, I know I sent it in the, you you gave it to me, I could throw it out in the email or. uh, Either way. So, so the course, so there's pre-work, right? So we take you with pre-work and then there's an on-site in San Diego in June 28th, I believe, right? So it's all day on the 28th, right? So there's four parts. So pre-work, live 
like in person, then the third port portion portion allows you to start learning how to decode human behavior and problem solve. And then the last portion of it allows how do you apply it into your own monetization, your own revenue streams within your company. So powerful. Love it. Love it. Yeah, it's fun. Everybody needs this. Um, I'm going to allow the space for everyone else to be able to ask questions because I would love to have the next week with you if it was up to me. So everyone, go ahead and raise your hand and we could take it from there. Thank you, Amelia, so much. Oh, my pleasure. Who would like to be first to? Brian, go for it. Hi, Amelia. Hello. Um, hello. Um, yeah. Um, Mine is uh, more of a general statement uh, because I've heard you um, many, many times on Clubhouse, as you know, um, between um, Breakfast with Champions, Achievers Breakfast Club, and uh, a, another club or two uh, that may or may not be running at this point. Um, so, uh, yeah, you, you definitely provide a lot of good wisdom as do um, a lot of the other people that we've uh, connected with on uh, or through Clubhouse and on other platforms. So it's just more of um, me saying um, thank you to you um, at this point. Um, I mean, obviously I'm a guy, so um, I think that your thing that is upcoming is for women. Um, so I would obviously not be able to attend, but no, our um, certification is men and women. It's, it's not for just for women. Oh. half our audience is men because a lot of the people that are in like HR and, and those things happen to be men. So no, it's not just for women. Oh, I love that. He, uh, he tapped on that because I didn't know that either. So fabulous to know. Yeah. We happen to be following, following secret knock for women. We're the day after, but our, our, our certification is all co-ed. Sweet. Thank you, Brian. I'm so glad you mentioned that. But it's, it's great to see you, Brian. Normally on Clubhouse, I can only hear you. I can't actually see you. Yes, great to see you as well, Amelia. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Please unmute. Hi, Amelia. I was able to, I attended Secret Knock um, for the first time. Um, and I was able to hear you speak. I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, you talked about your your morning routine and the things that you do. And that's one of the things that I added to my routine just in the last two or three years was, you know, doing the the gratitude and the, the meditations and stuff in the morning. Um, what are some of the things you do at night before you go to bed? Because you, you said you had a 22 minute routine that you do at night, but you didn't talk about it. Yeah. So for my evening, because I spend a lot of time by day in my masculine energy, right? Because, you know, my role as CEO is all the problem solving, right? It's all, all, it's all very masculine, very task and action oriented. So it's really, I love being a girl. I mean, I absolutely love being a girl, but it doesn't get showcased so much during the day because it's just, it's not in my, I, mean, I can't go in and negotiate with all my feminine energy. It wouldn't get me anywhere, right? And so my night is really protected for me to celebrate within myself what makes me feel like a woman, right? So I immediately, you know, I change my attire, right? So that I can kind of kind of get in my my girly kind of side. You know, I spend time in my own like self-care practices, like I'll light a candle, I'll do bath, I'll do a different type of kind of like uh it's a different type of meditation that tends a little bit more with um uh tones, right? So I, I work with the different tones to kind of tap into different areas of me. Um, usually something creative is something I'm usually working on. It's usually where you're going to find my reading. So I, I really remove myself. I practice three hours before I go to bed, no more decision-making two hours before bed, no food. And then one hour before I go to bed is all really feminine energy, right? Just, it's all that I can do to usually very goofy, you know, it's where I'm, you know, I find myself entertaining. Nobody else does, you know, playing with a dog and just doing things that, you know, just make me feel more female, right? So if I'm going to watch something, it's usually, you know, something comedy or, or something that's light or I'm, or I'm reading or, I'm, you know, doing some art thing, or I love to rearrange my house. It drives my kids crazy. Like I decided to redecorate or you know, redo something, but I really try to keep my evening 
really keeping the counterbalance of my feminine energy, right? So that I don't lose it. You know, we get so practiced as women in the workforce that we've become very hard. And I'm like, well, nobody wants to cuddle with a porcupine. So we have to practice the feminine energy. And, and my personal opinion is that the men in our life thrive when we can approach them with our feminine energy. Like we always have a choice whether we touch masculine energy with our masculine or our feminine side. And you always get better results <laughs> if you touch it with your feminine side, right? But we get in the routine of the action-oriented problem solving, um, and it usually doesn't make a very good mix. I have a question about that. So with your children, which energy do you feel, find yourself uh, addressing them in? Like, and, and how old are your children? So my daughter just turned 16, my son 28. Um, and so I use the energy based on the outcome I desire, right? So if I'm trying to teach them, and again, boy and girl, doesn't matter. If I'm trying to teach them to be more task oriented, right? Or more action oriented or more problem solving, then I'm very much more matter of fact, right? Because the female energy tends to be a little bit harder to follow and not very straight lined right? So do this, not that. Here's the cause, the fact, right? You're kind of being a little bit more, less words. And also usually my, my, my talk, my speech is matching, demonstrating the action that I want so that they can repeat it. Now, if it's something that has to do with them being seen, heard, recognized, valued, right? You know, grounded in a way of what they're saying matters in the world, then it's all my feminine energy right? Because the masculine energy is not going to be helpful there. So I, it's really based on your desired outcome, but that's also how I, I interrelate with my team, right? So based on the outcome, the message that I intend to land is what energy I go with. And so a lot of times, even though I would love to just have a task-oriented conversation, it's obvious to me that my feminine energy needs to lean in and just go, listen, it doesn't, it sounds like you're a little off today. You know, what do you need from me and how can I be supportive? And so I think that that is what we don't realize is that based on what we want as the outcome, that's what we lead. That's the energy we lead with. Really powerful. Very, very powerful. Thank you. I, I tend to like lean into my feminine a lot. And I would love um, uh, to learn how to tap into the masculine a bit more. So how would someone who's not super comfortable with the masculine learn that trait? Remove how you feel, hmm. right? So what happens is the reason why it's more difficult for you to lean into the actions is because you want to, you want the emotions to match it, right? You want to feel like it, you understand, you want like, you know, you want all of the talking and all of the detail, which none of that matters, right? And that's the difference between the masculine and the feminine energy, right? So if I have these three things that need to get done, I don't even think about, do I want to, how's it like, there's no thinking required, right? I just march through, right? And just execute the task without the hesitation. And so you can't switch back and forth between the two because then you're giving mixed messages, right? So it's, it's, and setting yourself up, you know, this is where I say time block, right? Time block just to stay in your masculine decision, action oriented, removing all emotion, try to do it for 30 minutes and then let yourself go back to your natural state. And then next time you do it, see if you can do 45 minutes right? And know that because it isn't your primary state of being, right? Time block three times a day, right? For 30 or 45 minutes where you're going to be just action oriented. Right. And the rest of the time, just be who you are. So how do you like pick the quadrants of like the things that are important enough to get, I, I remember you saying your values, but how do you identify your values to then match your calendar to it, to, to pick the quadrants of what goes where? Right. So you have to want to, you know, what is the thing, right, that you're here to give? You know, what is, what is the thing that you're leaving behind in the world? What is your what is your area of genius? Right. And so being able to delineate what exactly that is 
helps you realize where you should be spending your time and not spending your time, right? So once you understand this is my area of genius, and then you go, okay, if that's what I'm delivering to the world, how will the marketplace, right, pay for those services, right? So that your area of genius match the current marketplace and then start building the business from that and then feed into what it's going to take to get to your desired goal, knocking them out, right? Reverse engineer it. That's a whole, like when you go through the designing genius, you build your playbook. And from that playbook, it allows you to move back to what do I need to do today in order to drive that area of focus? And so if you pour, we have five areas of focus. And when you pour into them every single day consistently, it's mathematically impossible not to create progress, right? So if you just follow the system, you'll get where you want to go. The the problem is, is when people are inconsistent, right? So we always say, use your top of the day to pour into those five areas of first, and then what's left over, right? The leftovers you can give to other stuff, but you give the best of you to your priorities. The leftovers goes the opposite way. Most people give the people that they love the most, the leftovers. I'm like, that's backwards. Yeah. Uh, and it you identify what your values are based on who you give them to first. And then you, I did realize like my, my friends and my family were sometimes getting the leftovers because I was exhausted by the time I came to them. And I was like, shift, reroute. So when you go through the course, the course allows you to work through what actually you value. And then it takes you down another layer that be able to show you, well, what are the, what are the evidence? What's the ingredients of what you value? So it gets very, very, very specific so that you drop that into what you're actually going to do. Most people just don't know how to think through, right? The exercise. So we just created the exercise for you that what you're left with is actually your perfect day. And then you block that into what you're actually doing. So the system's already been created for you. It, you know, takes you like an hour. Amazing. There's no more guessing. Right. That's so powerful. I love how you like, I did this and now I get to have it go faster for you. So you don't have to go through this stuff. Right. Um, right. Kevin, go for it. All right. Well, I'm going to change a little bit from the whole feminine masculine energy thing. So change the topic. I was looking at your website a little bit and looking at your book and so on. So I guess based on your experience and understanding of like human behavior, how can entrepreneurs like build and increase that level of trust with their clients and customers? And so what kind of advice would you give for fostering strong relationships that are built on that trust? Yeah. So for entrepreneurs, we have a tendency to fall in love with our own ideas and our own company, right? And we then give it meaning right? So anything only has the meaning that you give to it, right? And so as entrepreneurs, since we're overly passionate individuals, we give a lot of things meaning that to the masses have no meaning. And so if you want to be able to serve better, it's about adopting a practice that allows you to understand the other person, right? The other vendor, the other employee, the other client, the other customer, to say what's important to them and what do they need to see, right? See here or experience that equals it's valuable because that's usually where there's a miss, right? We create a business. We think that business is going to bring value into the world without being able to say, well, what does the marketplace value? And are we aligned? And then how would you know, right? When people go, I have happy customers. I'm like, yeah. What, how, how do you know you have happy customers? Like what evidence can you gather that shows you you have happy customers? What can you see? What do you hear? And what do you experience, right? Because if you have happy customers, that means that you have consistent referrals. If you don't have consistent referrals, then you don't have any evidence that they're happy, right? So it's about taking what we think is true and questioning it and spinning it on the other side. You have to fall in love right? With the customer's outcome, not fall in love with the customer, fall in love with their outcome, the experience that they're having. That's what allows you to really close the gap between how you are serving. And if you can do that, if you can decode your, how your customers feel about you and the product, that's what's going to cause your business to scale because it's no longer about you. 
As long as it's about you, you hit a ceiling. Because we are never our customer. We forget that. We're not our avatar. And so you have to be able to get into your avatar's experience to better serve them. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. One, one of the things I do is I, I also get uh, testimonials from customers. And if you can get like a video testimonial, it's even more powerful. So even if it's just like a little 30 second clip, having those uh, testimonials of customers is is a key thing. And then if you look for the pattern, right? So if you have, say you have 20 testimonials, right? Is there one thing that all 20 of them said? Because if you can find that commonality, that's actually what you're delivering, that one thing. And then you say, okay, is my testimonials, right? So you look for as much common as you can through all of them. And then you say, is that what your brand promises? Because oftentimes what we say our brand promises doesn't even match the testimonials. And that's how you get into what's called brand alignment, right? That you are now making the promise and you have a very clear service that delivers that one thing that they all say. And this allows you to go narrow and deep. And so instead of trying to serve, right, let me solve five problems, five different products, serve one better than anybody else. So, so good. By the way, David put in the chat, the link to the event. So oh, thank you, David. You're everybody welcome. saw that. And David's got a question. I do have a question. It's probably a question you've answered a million times or other people would have asked or should have asked, but you know, we have a bunch of people at every entrepreneur at some point actually had a business, a nine to five job that they were doing while they were trying to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And in the paradigm that you've created that you, you know, in your vision, in your life, all that, all these little tricks and all these little, and not little, but these amazing tests that, you know, to bring out the best in people, what would you suggest or how, what advice would you give people to be able to focus on their entrepreneurship and balance with their regular job and trying to figure out what would be the best for them to break out of their nine to five job, whatever it's going to be, and be able to create that business um, to the extent and to, you know, for its fullest potential while they're doing everything and running their life and in their daily routine that you've mentioned. I mean, is there any advice that you have along those lines? All right. So it's being able to understand what actually gets you financially free, right? A lot okay. of times when people are working a day job and then their side hustle, they don't actually know where the tipping point is, right? So you have to be able to say, okay, in order for me to quit my day job to get my freedom back, I actually need, I'm going to make it up. I need to be able to make $5,000 a month or $10,000 a month. Like what is the nut that you actually need to make? And not necessarily what's matching your current salary. You have to be able to say, in order for me to live the life that I'm trying to live, I need X amount of dollars. And then you say, okay, if that's the X amount of dollars, how many deals is that? And then you say, who do I know who can bring me into that deal? so that you start creating that momentum and then you block. So you block. So if you start work at eight, then you block the hours before eight o'clock to work on your business. You're open for business from five to seven. And then you try to grab an afternoon if you can, if you can grab 12 to one and then grab from six to nine. And in those areas, you say, okay, if I need X amount of dollars, that means in these three touch points of today, I must close $500 and you don't stop until you hit it. Like that's how I do things. I literally mm -hmm. go, I will not eat and I am not sleeping until I hit my $500 period. And so that becomes my own motivation because the sooner I can do that, the sooner I can eat and go to bed. And so I am relentless when it comes to meeting my goals. I will not go to bed and go, oh, well, we'll make it up tomorrow. No, I will not go to bed, right? Okay. And so you try to make goals and then force yourself to achieve more than you think that you can. And it's not by doing it alone. It's literally by calling every single person that you know 
and say, I can't go to bed until I make $500, right? And then get there, right? Because you use your friend resources, right? Because then you'd be like, okay, what does your parents do? What do your brothers do? What do your sisters do? Like there is a direct line to the service that you provide right underneath your nose. You just have to find it. Thank you. Perfect. You know what I love about that question and that answer is that, you know, how I said, oh, I love doing this. Well, then the, there's that other aspect to where is the income producing activity? It's like, there's the, what I love doing. And then there's that hidden area of like, when, when does it become what you love become an income producing activity? Where's the tipping point point for that? And so the, the, the better way to think about that is to fall in love with all of it, right? Just to fall in love with all of it. Not being able to say, I just want to do the things that I love. Well, I love doing all the things, right? Even though it may not be like overly desirable. I realize that when I negotiate this deal or if I do this or I do that, that it's delivering my purpose. It's all part of delivering and solving the problem in the marketplace, right? My overall arching goal is to heal unintended pain. And so every time I'm doing something, I don't really think about, am I loving this, right? I love the entire process that's going to get this problem of pain, which seems to be everywhere. If that's my greatest work is to heal unintended pain. So all of it is part of it, right? right. We have a tendency to try to think that we're going to love it. Well, you know, 80% of building the business is the stuff that nobody wants to do. That's the stuff that you don't see. If you work for somebody else, that's the stuff you don't see. Right. Right. 20% of it is actually service. Most of it is the minutia. That's why most people don't do it. Right. Entrepreneurs and people go, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur. What's my best advice? I'm like, go get a job. There's nothing about this that's fun. Right. There is a hidden fire that I can't put out. Right. You know what I'm saying? If I had more sense, I would have done it differently, right? But this is what I was born to do. And I am ferocious about the tenacity that it takes in order to do it. It's not for everybody. And so I always say that if you like entrepreneurism, but you don't have that kind of drive inside of you, go work with an entrepreneur, right? Don't torture yourself. Go work for an entrepreneur, right? Because that is the closest thing to it that you get to do the joy part of it without some of the suffering. Right. I think the part that like, I remember uh, a coach saying what people not understanding what is an income producing activity, you know, like everybody knows what the fun part is and how then do you close those sales? I love what you said about like, call everybody, enroll everybody, talk to everybody. Don't go to sleep until it's done. You know, those are the areas that I rethink. I it was huge to, that you just said that. It, it really goes, oh. So I don't know if everybody else felt that, but I did. But, um, but that is the relent. That's the difference, right? Between when you talk about the us and the them, is I will do the things that people would go, that's absurd, right? Absurd, but it gets done, right? I will put myself in the most extraordinary, painful circumstances to get what needs to be done done. Right. Even though I don't like it or I don't want to. Right. I mean, some of the biggest success, the leapfrogs and a lot of the businesses that I've built is I put myself in extremely uncomfortable circumstances. You know, when I closed a, you know, well over a million dollar purchase order, I put myself in, you know, I flew across country, you know, I went in without an appointment. I stood in front of the man's bathroom for hours right? Until he, he showed up. Then I was like, oh, well, here he is now. Now what do I do? Right? I'm like, okay, I need three minutes of your time. Like I was beyond uncomfortable. I'm an introvert. I was so far out of my comfort zone, but losing was not an option. Right? And so I push myself in order to do the things that seem to be impossible, but that's the whole part of entrepreneurship is we're paving a different way. So the way you're going to grow your business is never doing with you what you want to do. The more you're uncomfortable, the more I tell you that's the right thing to do. Right. Right. Including calling, going, hey, can you put my phone, put me on the phone with your father? Because I got to, people are like, what? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I don't know him, but I got to talk to him. Right. I got a favorite ask. 
I mean, that's, that's the, the uncomfortable part of you get comfortable being uncomfortable because in any business, right? All the things that nobody else can do falls on your desk. The fun thing doesn't fall on my desk because everybody knows how to do those things. It's the thing that nobody wants to do. I do. So that means my entire day is doing the things that nobody can do or nobody wants to do. The fun stuff, those are taken. <laughs> well, I always assumed that, like, for example, opening it up to everybody asking questions. I love this space so much. I assumed everybody loved it. And so there were times I was hosting. I was like, if I can't like do it today, can somebody stand in? Nobody really wanted to do it. I was like, I go to sleep at night. So morning could come and I could do this. Like, how could someone pass this up? And yet that's when I realized what really drives us, what excites us is not the same for everybody. No, no. And, and you have to understand that when you're building something, right, it's not logical for you to think you're going to want to. You're not going to want to, but most things in life that are actually truly worthy, right? Create sustainable momentum. We don't want to like working out. We don't want to work out. It becomes a routine and it becomes a habit. So we work out, but nobody goes, you know what I want to do today? <laughs> I want to go spend. No, you, you know what I'm saying? We create things, healthy habits, right? To get us continually to grow, right? Stay curious and become a better self. But those things we don't, we don't actually want to, right? And so that's what you, you know, we have this false thing because of social media, this idea that we're, we, we do the things that we want to do. And I was like, no, no, I want to sit and eat a whole cake, but that's not good for me. So instead I'll eat my salad. Do I want to eat the salad? I don't want to eat the salad. I want to eat the cake. But right. those are choices, right? I also don't want to look like the side of the house. So <laughs> I will eat the salad, right? So it's, you're always trading. And when you can teach that in, you know, a, a matter of life skill, right? To be able to say, what is it that I don't see right now? And what decision am I making right now? Well, I'm making the decision to be productive. So I'm getting to get out of bed instead of hit my alarm. Well, now what I'm trying to do, well, now I'm working on my 22 minutes. That's going to increase my capacity. So I'm going to protect it. Now, what am I doing? You have to understand that you're making all of these small choices every single day and you're choosing either to become more or stay the same. Absolutely. And those mini hacks every day absolutely add to it. Like consistent brain hacks for myself. I'm always yeah. twisting something in my head to like create a whole new, uh, one day I didn't want to go out, uh, go work out. And I was like, I'm going to put on my tennis shoes, the other shoe first, and then I'm going to tie them differently. I mean, it was like so retarded what I came up with, but I got yeah, myself. Or just say I'm going to walk, right? You, it, it's more about the movement, right? Move your brain, move your body and move your purpose every day. Move them, move them, move them, move them, move them, right? Because you ha have to understand you will lose them, right? So every time you allow yourself to restart, it really is a restart, right? So I don't know if you guys ever did like 75 hard, right? You know what I'm talking about? The app 75 hard, right? 75 days of consistency. Well, what happens is when you skip a day, you got to start back over on day one. And so it's psychologically teaching like, oh, I'm already, you know, halfway there. Do I really want to start all over, right? You understand the, the small choice in this moment, right? Creates great pain of having to restart. And so that's what you have to realize is that you're constantly making decisions of becoming the version of you, which then is the life that you want. And so if you can, you know, craft your ideal life and then realize you're making the choice in this moment to work towards it and pull away from it. And so, you know, I tell people it's not your time you have to protect. It's your thoughts and your energy. Don't let people in your head and definitely do not share your, en your energy with people who don't bring it back in fuller capacity, right? If I share my energy with you, I want you to feel better, right? Not drained, right? You should feel better after we spent time together or you shouldn't, don't do that again, right? Don't be around things that make you feel worse or drain your energy. Something in the chat. Tiffany, did you want to ask a question? And I know that, sorry, I didn't, I didn't want to like 
walk over people's uh, opportunities to ask questions, but. I don't think her microphone's working, so it needs to be read to oh. Amelia. Oh. Can you read it for me, David? I and can read it. All you right. have the better voice. Okay. Reading. How do you stay authentic and true to your customers and the world in general and show a little vulnerability, not as a weakness per Bean Brown, without seeming weak and let others take advantage of you? Okay. So, you know, not being taken advantage of is really about being really, really clear in what you deliver, right? And not to try to deliver all things to all people. So we have an exercise, which is called letter to your friends, right? You take the 10 people that you're close with and you literally say, why are we friends? Because what you think your value is, is usually not what the value is. And so when I did this exercise a million years ago, I thought I needed to be friendly and I needed to be warm and I had to be the mom that picked everybody up. Like I had all these things that I thought I needed to be in order to have my friendships. And then when I asked them, why were they friends with me? The common denominator was I was the most objective problem solver and, and clear, clarity with no bullshit, right? That's why people were friends with me because they always knew they got a straight answer and they always knew that the way I would solve the problem would be far more efficient than what they thought. So it allowed me not to try to be the funny one, the friendly one, the pick up the kids front, that, that none of those things mattered. And so it allows you to be very precise on the value you deliver. And so now I can hold space that my connection with people is if they're in trouble or if they're in crisis or they need to like figure something out, I'm like the go-to girl for them. And so I do that better than anything else. And I can save my energy from trying to do all those other things. So my first thing is to get really clear on not what you think the value is, ask them what your value is so that you can hold space on just that. Once you know what that thing is, it frees you from having to overly explain, right? And overly try to pull in from other areas. You can just get narrow and deep that that's what it is. And then you become very unapologetic because you understand the value of that, right? So if you're, if everybody says, oh, the reason why we're friends is because you're reliable or oh, the reason why we're always friends is because I always feel good around you, right? Then you understand that that thing is extremely valuable in life. And now you'll defend it with a minimum standard, right? So that that standard allows you not to get taken advantage of right? So I'm happy to problem solve for you, but I will find it annoying if you don't take action. I'll say, stop asking me for what I think you should do next. And then you don't do what I say you should need to do next. So don't ask me anymore. Like I will remove the privilege of putting more brain power into coming up with the answer if you're not going to respect and take action on it. Like why bother, right? So I have standards where I will not repeat my effort if you're not matching the same effort on the other side. I can't care about your business more than you, right? And I can't care about your relationships more than you. I can't care about you more than you. And so my minimum standard is I am looking to see if we got equal energy here on the exchange. And if not, I will be the one who pulls back. Right. And so that's what you want to make sure about the taking advantage of is no different than having an argument. You can't have an argument unless you participate and you can't be taken advantage of unless you participate. And so participate one time and then say, you know, this doesn't seem to be working out as a win win. So if you want me to do X, I expect Y. Every give should have an ask. It's an exchange, you're not a charity. Amazing answer. Thank you. Dorinda, oh, I know like I asked her to that. Was that, did I answer her question? Cause I don't, can she just say yes or no? Was that what she was, what she was looking for? Incredible. There, thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I love Tiffany. Dorinda, did you, I saw your hand up and I know we're 
like at time. Um, I want to know, actually, Louisa, you had asked the question that I wanted to ask. So David asked question and you asked, it was the same question. So answered perfectly. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Amelia, this was so powerful. So powerful. I mean, you come in and it's like odd. <laughs> And, and your answers are so direct, so clear, so powerful. It's exactly, you know, when, when you have an experience of somebody and they really are consistently that person, it is magical. And I am so privileged to be able to share you with the world today. And one of the things I didn't, I didn't get to say is like, this all goes into a podcast. So I just want everyone to know, I hope you're comfortable. You're, you're, all of this is going to be highlighted in a podcast because what was happening is I was having all this amazing content. It was sitting in my zoom links and I was like, the world gets to hear all of this. There's so much value in here. And I don't want to like be hiding all this information that could change the world. And that's what we're doing in here is we're really creating movement and information for people to take action in their life. So I am That's so what I try to help people do, right? I have a really big heart too, right? And I love, I love to give. But what you start to realize is on the road to success is that need that you feel to give is really your inner you asking you to serve yourself. Right. So whatever it is that you decide you want to do, right? So if you're like, oh my God, I want to pick this up because, this, because you know, Tess would really like that. Then say, well, what is this act of kindness I'm trying to do, right? Am I trying to show her that I was thinking about her, right? And then say, what am I going to do to say that I was thinking about myself? Not to stop the give that I'm giving the test, but it's a reminder that my inner child is also looking to be recognized. So if we always take care of ourselves, then our cup stays full and then we can give to others, right? But giving from the empty cup is what causes the pain. So just take the next week and when you get an instinct to give, give self, give, don't forget self, right? The self-love. And that's the easiest way for people who have really big hearts to start moving in that direction. Because unfortunately, we love somebody and then we're hoping they love us back and they don't. And it's painful, right? So I give something to test and I'm like, well, why didn't she do it back? And she's like, well, I didn't know I was supposed to do it back, right? And so it's an indicator on how we are craving something within ourselves. So still do the give but really lean in and say, this is something that I need to do for myself. So take that five minutes and, and give yourself a bath or take that five minutes and go for the walk or take that five minutes and, you know, whatever, go get your manicure, right? But don't ignore the trigger of emotion without realizing that's you trying to talk to you that you need the self-care. Right. That's what I feel like you even tapped on with the first 22 minutes, the last 22 minutes, like start your day and end your day with I matter the most. And I even do that with my calendar before I put anything else on my calendar for the week. The first thing I do is put everything I want to do first. And like my workouts, my meditations, my anything and everything, everything's going on there. But my brain is like, yay, me. So I put all the stuff I want to do first and then add everything else. So my brain is like, and, and that's how you start teaching the life skill, right? So I take care of my needs right before I wake up my daughter. And then what I'm trying to teach her is what does she need, right? What time do you need in order to get ready to feel like you're off to school in a time where you feel good about yourself, right? And not have her just say, well, I only need 15 minutes. I'm like, okay, how long does it take you to get your mind right? How long does it take you? Whatever, you know, so you're not rushed, right? That's the problem is when we teach the life skill of hurry up, hurry up, you're late, you're late, 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 we're going to be late, we're going to whatever. Then what happens is you create anxious children who always think they're late and they're not good enough, right? Because they didn't learn, right? The life skill of choosing their day, right? And so you don't understand that in your need, because you haven't learned how to prepare the life skill to step into your day, you're creating another generation who also thinks they need to hurry up because they're being late because they're late for their day, which means they're not good enough. You're teaching the behavior that they're going to have to survive from, right? So I try to lean in to say, okay, not to give her the answers, 
for, to lead her to the answers. How much time do you think you need for this? How much time do you free for that? And then say, okay, today you gave yourself an hour. How did you feel when you went to school? Yesterday, you gave yourself 30 minutes. Did you feel differently? Right. To lead her to making decisions about life. So good. I have a 15 year old. So I love the fact that you said that. I, and we do the gratitude question. I'm like, what are you grateful for? She says, myself. I'm like, oh, I love you, baby girl. What else are you grateful for? She's like, myself. And then I- ask her what she's looking forward to. Right. So if you ask a child what they're looking forward to, it instills hope. Mm, I like that. You teach hope. I like that. I love the fact that they listen to all of this. And I heard my daughter say to my son the other day, well, that's a fixed mindset. And, you know, if you want to have a growth mindset, I was like, or my son said, well, I think you need to change your paradigm. I'm like, I love these children, you know, to have two young ones who speak like this right now. I just love it. I do too. I do too. Well, thank you guys. Thank you guys all so very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone unmute and please give Amelia as much love as possible. We are so grateful for you.